Hi everyone, this is Ashley L. Jones, author of Modern Cast Iron, and as you may know by now, I am preparing a new book called Skillet Heads, and the idea behind that book is that we're going to hear from the pros, from people who collect and restore cast iron, and all the nitty-gritty about how they do what they do. So today I have with me Matt Bright of Orphaned Iron. Thank you for joining us today. Yeah, um, thanks for the invite. This is so great. And everybody check out that background he's got. Okay. That's for real. I mean, this is his kitchen, right? This right. Is yep, that's kitchen. The kitchen. This is insanity. Now, how many pieces do you have in your personal collection? Um, my personal collection is about, I would say 500, but I have like 3,500 pieces total right now. Oh my gosh. That's by far the the biggest personal collection of any of the restorers I've talked to so far. So that's insane. Do you use these, the ones that are on your wall? Yeah, I do use them. I just switch them out periodically, use different ones throughout the week or whatever. That's amazing. That's amazing. Okay. So orphaned iron. Now this is a full-time job for you, right? Where you restore and sell cast iron cookware on your Etsy page online. So first of all, why Orphaned Iron? What's, what's behind the name there? I just feel like Orphan describes all the rusty pans you see at garage sales or like thrift shops or whatever. And I like to get them new homes basically after they're restored. I, I love that because it speaks to the history behind the cast iron because you don't know how many families that cast iron lived in and how many people right. fed for how many generations and uh, I know in some emails we went back and forth and we were kind of talking about that idea that you know the cast iron had a home and now it doesn't and I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that people don't know how to take care of it anymore. So grandma's pan, you know, they don't want it to, to go to waste. So they pass it on. It, we've just lost that knowledge, right? You know, how to take right. care of it. Now you you have a very popular TikTok account. Mm -hmm. yep. and you, you go into this, right? You, you help share tips on how to take care of it and restore cast iron at home. Yeah. So I actually share everything as far as how I restore it or how I clean, like after I cook, and anybody can follow it and go through the videos. And I answer questions all the time on there. Um, so I don't hide anything. There's no special secrets I have. I just give everybody the information if they want to do it themselves at home. Oh, that's fantastic. Okay, so we can get information um, from you on your social media accounts. People can buy restored cast iron from you. And then you also do kind of a fee for service, right? Where people can reach out to you and have their own grandma's pan restored by you and then sent back. Yeah. So if people are a little uh, scared to do it themselves or worried that they might mess something up, they can ship it to me. And I basically it's just 20 bucks and then I ship it back when it's finished. As someone who has tried to restore <laughs> a pan the hard way, uh, 20 bucks is um, definitely worth that. Uh, yeah, definitely worth it. Now, a lot of the restorers I've talked to have their method. Everybody has their method. Okay, so there's everything from certain sprays like oven cleaner sprays and rust removing sprays, and then there's um electrolysis tanks which might be very new to folks watching but that's a very popular method um there's lye baths it's it's kind of insane the the methods and the extent that people will go to to restore cast iron and that's really what the whole book's about but you surprised me you were the only person so far who said that you have one method for all of it and what is that electrolysis cleans everything so it'll remove rust, food, or oil, basically anything that's on the pan, even paint. Um, whereas lye will only remove um, natural stuff like oils and foods. So it won't remove the rust after you pull it out, it's still rusty. And then vinegar removes rust, but it's also dangerous because it can damage the finish. So electrolysis is just like the safest method to use and it, it takes care of everything all at once. And it even takes the seasoning off. Yeah. So when you're done with your electrolysis, is your pan back to the original silver? Yeah, just bare iron. And then I, I bring it inside and I scrub it down with soap and water, rinse it really good, dry it, 
and then I oil it and season it. That is amazing because I heard that it only does rust and only, you know, and so you're saying it'll do it all. Now, does it take longer to do it all? You know, how about how long are you putting it in the tank? Uh, usually I have three tanks and usually what I do is I just hang a one pan in each one. So three a day and I leave them for 24 hours and about the same time every day I go out and pull them out and scrub them down. And then I just replace those with new pants. Wow. That sounds very feasible. <laughs> that right. sounds like something we could do at home. Um, but I, I know that building the e-take and monitoring it and keeping it going is it's a little scarier than to me. Uh, it uses a, a battery charger to right. create um, the electrical charge that you need to pull the rust off the pan. It's, it's very interesting. Um, I am still hesitant to do it myself, although... I've said I won't do it, but I'm, I'm, I don't know. I, I keep trying to challenge myself to do it. We'll see. I'm afraid of electrocuting right. myself, but I, I hear it's not quite that easy to electrocute yourself with a charger. No, even if it's running, you can put your hand in the water and you won't get electrocuted unless you grab both ends of the oh. charger. Yeah, I, I probably wouldn't do that. Yeah, <laughs> it's, still, so it's, it's, it's still a little scary. safer than people think. Well, that's good. Okay. Now, how often do you empty your solution? Because that's something I'm not seeing online a lot. How often do you have uh, to dump that water out? You don't see it because once the water evaporates, people just add more water. Okay. Um, all it is is water and washing soda. So the washing soda never evaporates. So right. as long as you keep it full, you're fine. Um, but eventually you'll have like, you know, a, a good buildup in the bottom yeah. of stuff that's come off. And I usually empty mine every six months to a year. It kind of depends on what huh. I put in it. Oh, okay. Okay. I thought it would be a lot more frequent now to, and, and I'm going to have um, lots of details about how to create an e-tank in the book and in diagrams and such. And I know you have a lot of information that people can go ahead and find on your TikTok channel. Um, you have to use sacrificial anodes uh, around your tank. And a lot of people use like a 50 gallon drum or something like that, or a, a big trash can. Is that what you use? Like a large trash can? I use the blue 55 gallon okay. drums. That, okay. Yeah. Cause you know, Just that's cut the top off. Okay. Yep. Okay. Um, how often do you have to clean those sacrificial anodes? Because I understand they have to be cleaned every once in a while. So what I do and what most of the restorers will tell you is you, once it's dirty, you'll notice that it's not cleaning as quickly. And we put in, we, most people put in like a Taiwan skillet or a cracked pan that they can't uh -huh. make into something else. And they'll reverse the charge. So everything's okay. pulled off of the anode to the skillet. So wow. it kind of cleans it for you. And then you can just run a brush down it real quick, scrub it off. I really wish they had done this in chemistry in high school, because this would have been a lot more interesting than whatever it was that my teacher was trying to do that I it never clicked. But this stuff is very interesting, how you can pull basically rust from one pan and put it on an anode or reverse your charge and pull it off the anode and put it back on your on your pan. It's it's really fascinating and it's really chemistry at work. I, I think more kids could, should do this kind of stuff for science fair projects or something, um, because it's just it, it's useful. Right. It's very useful and it's very interesting to me. Now, once you clean your pan, everybody has to season. And you said everybody does this differently. And I think you you said you use one particular thing every time. What was that? Your seasonal? I, I just use Chris, Crisco shortening. It's in the blue can. That's all I've ever used. It works great. I've never had an issue, so I don't feel the need to change now. That's awesome because there are a lot of different seasonings out there that can be a bit expensive or you know have a lot of requirements on okay you heat it you do do you just wipe it on once and you're done is that how you do it um so basically you want to warm your pan up and then you coat the entire pan so the whole thing's shiny basically even the handle the outside the bottom and then you wipe as much off as you can and i use blue shop paper towels for that mm -hmm. you want basically all the residue off before you bake it mm -hmm. so as little oil as possible and then you do that two or three times uh, okay. bake it two or three different times and another issue is that of the smoke point point. and you said in your email you usually go about 450 degrees and you're definitely going to have some smoke generate from that so you just make sure your your kitchen is is ventilated yeah i have a, a big basically an old industrial fan i put in the window and it pulls everything out okay. while i do it 
Okay. Some people do it in their garage. They have an extra stove. Right, right. To avoid right. It. Okay. Now, when you think of things that are difficult to restore, I think of big, big things because it's got to fit inside that e-tank or you're going to have to get a bigger e-tank or something. So, um, but when I asked you what was, what was difficult, you said you were working on a pair of candelabras, I believe. Oh, yes. Yeah, those were terrible. But they, they don't need seasoned, obviously, but they had a bunch of rust on them. Um, so I had to keep turning them in the e-tank because electrolysis only works in line of sight. So if the piece of metal isn't facing the anode on the outside, it doesn't really remove the the iron or the rust off the iron. Um, so once they were done, I just painted them obviously, oh. but they took a long time to get all the rust off. Okay. That makes sense. That makes sense. And then cookware like uh, waffle irons or something that everybody complains about cleaning or the little corn stick pans because there's so many grooves. Yes. They just okay. take extra time. Okay. Okay. So the, the fix to that is you just leave it in longer and turn it around more. Right. Okay. Now, um, where are you getting all of your cast iron? Uh, well, this weekend I did the 127 garage sales, if you've ever heard of that. It goes, I think it goes from Michigan to Georgia. It's, wow, uh, and, the, and you're in Ohio. Yeah, so I just went down to Kentucky and I have a few uh, dealers in Ohio that's, that hold stuff for me because they know I'll be there every year. And uh, I'm buying a collection tomorrow, and then I'm buying a collection on Tuesday from people I met on the garage sales. Okay. Now that's so just net networking. Networking. Okay. And that's something that I'm hearing a lot of from, from different restorers is that buying in bulk can usually yeah. be a, a really good deal. You're spending a lot more money, obviously, because you, you may be buying 20 different things at once and sometimes not even all cast iron. <laughs> sometimes I, right. I hear there's other things, other vintage pieces included, but they say that's just um, a really good way to get more bang for your buck. So so you embrace the bulk buy to them. Yeah, I've, I've driven to Tennessee and Oklahoma and all kinds of places to buy collections, but that was hundreds of pieces at once. Wow. Okay. Now, obviously your, your family has to support this. <laughs> they have to be yeah. on board with this because this is your full-time job. Yep. So my mom lives, she lives about a mile away and my sister is probably 10 miles away and my mom will bring me pool noodles. Uh, there's a video I put on TikTok of her. I asked her to grab me like 40 pool noodles and she ended up bringing over 300. <sighs> I saw so. this in the pool noodles you used to help package the cast iron when you mail it out right right just to keep it safe on shipment because it yeah. will break it's pretty fragile yeah people don't realize that cast iron is brittle um, right so any impact can break it or drastic uh, temperature changes uh, right right so people should definitely check out your tiktok channel because that um i did see that video and i think you kind of sped it up even and that was just i I was dumbfounded that you could do that with a pool noodle. <laughs> I've had to mail my fair share of cast iron to um, promote modern cast iron. And you wouldn't believe how hard it is to mail a piece of cast iron. It's ridiculous. So yes, pool, pool noodle is the trick there. I, I really like that. So um, we know about orphan iron. We know what you're doing. Back up a second and just kind of tell us why. I mean, there's so much effort in this. It's it's a career for you at this point. You are now a pro and expert in cast iron. What in the world started you down this trail? Uh, my dad was raised by his grandparents and they always cooked with cast iron. So when I was growing up, that's what he cooked in. And he had his own little wall of it that went to the basement. So before he passed, I bought a house and he, he gave me a few pans. And then when he did pass, um, I just kind of, took it and ran and started grabbing it to keep him in my memory, you know, doing stuff that we used to do together. So I've, I've never stopped since that happened. That was about four years ago. That's, that's really, that's really great. You know, just keeping his memory alive and it, it cast iron is always that tangible, usable piece of history, but when it's so personal, it's, it, it just takes on a different, a different layer there. Um, your favorite pans, your favorite brands. Uh, that's the favorite. 
the which is favorite. easy to easy to remember i have one sitting right here awesome if you can see it there it's got a little bit of sulfur pitting on it but um the story is they were made by inmates in the columbus penitentiary or ohio penitentiary in columbus ohio and that was 1880 to 1902. I, I mean, before working on this book, I had no idea that we had inmates working on cast iron. I mean, that's right. I, I mean, I've only heard of inmates doing certain things like license plates or whatever, but I, I just thought that was amazing. It, when you think about what goes into cast iron cooking and, and or cast iron cookware, and you're having to forge the iron and the heat involved in everything, I mean, um, it's quite an undertaking and uh I, I just think that's amazing that they they had inmates that they could trust that they could keep safe that they could do this so that's amazing yeah. so the brand is the favorite yeah and then there's another brand called favorite pickwell wear and that was in pickwell how they're completely different oh they are oh i yes. didn't realize that okay very good all right so we're going to get into what the different kinds of brands are and where they were from in the book too but um a lot of those companies have gone out and those two are no longer around so right. when it comes to cast iron though you stick to the old stuff right you stick to vintage yep there are some new companies that make um you know quality finished pans i just i don't i have so many that why would i buy one yeah you probably don't have a need just right. kind of engaging by, by what's just behind you alone. You probably don't need to buy any new ones. Um, smooth versus textured. I think, I don't think it really matters as far as cooking goes, but people get caught up on wanting their food not to stick immediately. Mm -hmm. And cast iron seasoning is really something you have to keep working on mm -hmm. um, as you go and it builds up over time. So if you have a textured pan, you can cook an egg just as good as you can on a smooth pan. But people, um, I guess, are afraid to put oil in the pan, like a normal aluminum pan or whatever you're using. I always add a little oil before I cook and let it warm up, mm -hmm. and you'll never have anything stick. Some pans don't need it, so. Yeah, that's that's kind of the general consensus I'm getting from folks is that if, if you use some kind of oil when you cook and you have a seasoned pan you're not going to have a problem whether it's textured or not but it does seem that restorers and and just cast iron fans in general favor the the smooth pans of the past and um i think that's interesting uh, but a lot of the newer ones are textured like lodge lodge is the big one that's that's right. still in existence and textured and um, I did a blog post on smooth versus textured, and I, I think I've got more hits on that than anything else. <laughs> it's very right. interesting how, how it matters to everybody. But uh, but yeah, I think either one would would work. So um, what's what's your like favorite go to meals in your cast iron? Because obviously you have to cook it, right? <laughs> yes. Please tell me you cook I, it. <laughs> I do. Um, my mom and dad both had, had made um, chicken broccoli casserole, which is just rice, chicken, mm -hmm. cheese, onions, stuff like that. And I like to make it sometimes. And then there's just like the typical sports fan stuff. I make like cheese dips and things like that. And then a lot and your Hello. burgers, obviously. Yeah. Everybody yeah. likes a hamburger from cast iron. Yes. Yeah. There's a lot of um, talk about steaks, but burgers and cast iron are, are just as good. Um, I don't think they get yeah. enough, enough press. <laughs> Well, what would you tell folks who are just kind of getting started where, you know, maybe they're just hearing some of these terms for the first time, like electrolysis tanks and favorite cookware. What, what would you say to folks like that? Um, I would say them? be patient mm -hmm. and st start with something that's in the 40 to $60 range. Even if you want a vintage pan, you can get something in that range that's nice. It'll last forever. And if you mess up, you can always reseason it. It's not a huge deal. That, that's a very good, good point. It'll, as long as you're not, like you said, using um, drastic heat changes or, you know, just banging it around, um, it'll last you. So it, it's kind of forgiving. Um, so that's, that's a good point. You're not going to destroy it. You can try and try again. <laughs> right. Well, I, I love this. And I love that people who, you know, who maybe don't want to take that step to redo it themselves, have people like you 
uh, at Orphaned Iron and they can reach out to you and say, please help me with grandma's pan and they can ship it to you and then you will carefully ship it back to them with half of the pool noodle around it. So it will be nice and safe. And, uh, and they can also find more information about how to restore it on your TikTok channel. So I will include your, um, your website, social media in the description so folks can find you. And uh, I hope they will go ahead and reach out to you and we will have a nice spread uh, about Orphaned Iron in my upcoming book, Skillet Heads. And uh, we will also hopefully feature a couple of recipes from Matt. So thank you for watching everyone. Reach out to Orphaned Iron and let him know what you need. Thanks for watching. Mm -hmm.